uh, let me give you a more broader answer uh, for the first question about the cortical myoclonus uh, being this way or that way. Um, um, let, let me give you an example from Korea first, and then we'll come back to the myoclonus. You know, there, there, are, there is a Korea, right? So you see a movement, you say, okay, this is Korea. And then we say, okay, this is a Korea from Huntington's and this is a Korea from Sydenham, this is a Korea from hyperglycemia, this is a Korea from medication, this is from levodopa, so on and so forth. Although they have, they look similar, but they're also very different. You can see different types of Korea and you can tell this is a Sydenham Korea, this is a Huntington's Korea, this is a levodopa induced Korea, this is a tardive Korea, this is uh, from hyperglycemia. They have some differences in their presentation. The word I use is the French word gestalt, that their overall combination of, of, of things is, is somewhat different than someone else's Korea. It may be location, it may be speed, it may be pauses or lack of pauses, it may be response to gait or changes based on posture. All of those things are builds a gestalt of a, of a phenomena. And so those phenomena look very different. Uh, uh, so let's bring it back to this question of cortical myoclonus. So cortical myoclonus is any myoclonus where the cortex is involved, right? So that's where we call it cortical myoclonus. That's it. Now, the gestalt of cortical myoclonus that is caused by uh, hypoxia is different than gestalt of myoclonus, cortical myoclonus caused by encephalopathy is different from drug-induced cortical myoclonus. All of these are cortical myoclonus. So the action-induced myoclonus and stimulus so action-induced myoclonus in, uh, is very classic gestalt of a post-hypoxic myoclonus. While the myoclonus for this patient uh, that, that we're trying to see is a gestalt of a corticobasal ganglionic degeneration myoclonus. And, and they're not going to look different. So the corticobasal ganglionic degeneration myoclonus is, is cortical, but is less action-induced and more... Uh, stimulus sensitive and more at rest. So they have jerkiness at rest and they have jerkiness of stimulus, but not as much as an action. They also have a lot of dystonic feature because there is an ongoing dystonia along with that myoclonus. So they have a lot of dystonic looking jerks. So sometimes you cannot tell if it's a slow myoclonus or if it was a dystonic, fast dystonic jerks. Or, and so often uh, I debate between this that or do they really have true myoclonus or is it just a fast dystonic jerks that we're seeing or dystonic myoclonus. Sometimes we call it a myoclonic dystonia that we see with these patients. But the, the commonality between the two will be that they are stimulus induced, that there is a cortical reflex myoclonus so that if you jerk their fingers or, uh, or quickly move their limb, then they will, you'll have a reactive myoclonus. That's a reflex myoclonus. So that's present in both hypoxic and CBGD patient. Stimulus sensitivity is present in both hypoxic and in CBGD patient, equal proximal distal involvement is present in both of them. So there are commonalities which creates them in the category of cortical myoclonus, but then there is a difference in gestalt between them and they don't look exactly the same um, uh, side by side. The, the second question you were asking was about uh, the patient who had uh, estrexis, right? That was the patient who had both proximal distal. Tell me that question again. Yes, the patient that had uh, that has uh, anastrexis. Uh, the question was as uh, uh, the subcortical myoclonus should be a proximal one. Yeah, anastrexis are just uh, negative uh, negative myoclonus and distal. Mm -hmm. Right. So again, you know that that that's a, that's a challenging one to label. I think the uh, the pathology in that particular patient, the video was a lesion, either a tumor or a bleed subcortical. They were showing. The, the, if you, if you become more, if you really debate this, then estrexis is actually a cortical myoclonus. Estrexis is not a subcortical phenomena. Estrexis is a, 
is a negative myoclonus with some positive in between that happens in patient with uh, encephalopathy, either most classically uh, hepatic or ammonia related encephalopathy, but can be seen with uh, renal or uremic encephalopathy. It can be seen with CO2 narcosis or respiratory failure encephalopathy. So those patients have a diffuse cortical and subcortical involvement and they have a classic estrexis. So that's a true estrexis. And I didn't actually see the classic estrexis on that patient. So the hand was not really going down like you would expect. There was some proximal jerking. So he has a unusual or atypical kind of a presentation. So you cannot classically fit into a subcortical myoclonus, but that's the closest label they gave that patient. Uh, I may not have given it that label, but you know, we, we try to label things into, uh, we try to force uh, patients into the squares we've created for them. So even if it's a round peg, we try to put it in a, into a square that we want them to be in. Uh, so, you know, the, the, all of these are debatable.